Well, in my opening statement this evening, the blinded faith. Last week we saw the sadistic, brutal and gut-wrenching murder of an innocent Sri Lankan who was working in Sialkot in Pakistan, a city around 120 kilometers away from the northern city of Lahore. Now, the city of Lahore, if any one of you remember, was a city Sri Lanka played Australia to win the World Cup back in 1996. If you out there who can stomach the go and manage to see that horrible video of the mob attacking Priyantha Kumara, which eventually ended in his murder, what happened here? So far as per the events that came to light, a recently unbanned uh, hardline Islamist political group called TLP attacked Priyantha, dragged his body on the streets and then hanged him, beat him and later set his body on fire. At the same time, thousands of idiotic, inhumane, worthless Pakistanis chanted their dumb slogans and videoed it, displaying the primitive and inhumaneness of what their society is all about. It was a heartbreaking incident. Priyanta left Sri Lanka in 2010 to work in Pakistan. He's been working in that factory for more than a decade. He has two sons, aged 14 and 9 years old. If you look at the 9-year-old son's face, you, it breaks your heart because he still doesn't understand or comprehend what's going on. His wife's still trying to figure out what has happened. Now the incident that has led to this unrest was that he tore a poster that belonged to the banner, banned Islamic uh, political group TLP later which was unbanned by Prime Minister Imran Khan. The poster is said to have contained a sentence from the Holy Quran. Priyanta had torn it after they had pasted those posters on the walls of the factory he was working in. So let me get this straight. He tears a poster and the punishment is public execution? Is this really occurring in 2021? Is Pakistan society still stuck in the primitive past? Haven't anyone told them that the world has moved on? Priyanta, a Sri Lankan, a Buddhist who does not believe in Islam, engages in a forgivable mistake. Yes, it is a forgivable mistake. We've seen here in Sri Lanka thousands of times where foreigners go into our temples not knowing the, the customs. We don't take them, hang them uh, on any of our, you know, in public places. So the ones who claim to practice the peaceful religion of Islam's verdict is murder. What has gone wrong here? If we look at it from the side of the mob, just to understand their primitive minds, they fought for their God. They thought that punishing this person who had taught the wordings of their God was the right thing to do. Why? Because since the day they were born in that society, this is what they have been taught. The blinded faith. We also saw that kind of blindness in Sri Lanka that resulted in a carnage. A man called Saharan who forgot that he is living in a Buddhist country, who went astray with religious blindness, carried out one of the most heinous attacks on Sri Lankan soil. What's happening here? We must understand that the education systems we put in place to educate us of a better world, a better society, a better tomorrow, have failed immensely. It failed in Pakistan, it failed in Sri Lanka. The very people who should have taught the good from the bad, the religious leaders, the imams in those mosques in Pakistan, the leaders of faith, should have taught these individuals that despite only 1.5 billion people in the world believes in the religion of Islam, the remaining 5.5 billion in the world does not. And that doesn't give them the, or give them the right to force the doctrine of Islam down anybody's throat. Listen, I'm a Christian, and my guest tonight is a religious leader in the philosophy of Buddhism. Do you think we're going to fight after the break? Heck, most of the people I work are of other religions. Do you think it gives me the right to impose my beliefs on them and force them to follow that? Or hold them accountable for things I believe as mistakes based on my religion and punish them for something that they don't even believe in? Well, 
if you go with that theory, the Bible says in the book of Second Chronicles chapter 15, verse 12, that whoever should not seek the Lord, the God of Israel, should be put to death, whether young or old, man or woman. So what? I should do it, do it like bring an axe to work and start swinging it and start killing people because they don't believe in God? The only axe that I see at work is that horrible body spray. Listen, my producer is a Buddhist. He has often mentioned to me that in his belief, he has massive problems with Christianity because he thinks that his religion is the utmost pure one in his mind. Does that mean I should drag him onto the streets and hang him and then set his body on fire? Who's going to produce my show afterwards? Every day we learn about new things. We learn how different we are as human beings. We learn new things about ourselves and our society. When we do, we move away from our primitiveness and embrace the modern merely because we want to live in a better world. But unfortunately, we can't talk about a better world to live in if our actions are from a world we are so desperately trying to move away from. As much as the education system in Pakistan failed to teach their children the importance of tolerance, it also failed to teach our children here in Sri Lanka the importance of selflessness. That's why in our Sri Lankan society we don't see a brigade standing against this inhuman act, striking up, striking up a conversation on social media or at least protesting. Oh heck, the very people who changed their profile picture saying black lives matter, pray for France, something happening in the United States and France, all stood up with the Me Too movement. Completely westernized thing. All of those keyboard heroes are missing to make a stand today with the injustices that occurred to Priyantha. Perhaps it's because Priyantha's murder was not a catchy TikTok trend, or still not fashionable enough to be portrayed. And that's where our education system has failed. Well, despite all this, everything is not lost. I always like to see some kind of a silver lining in a grim situation. Just as thousands and thousands were chanting bullshit slogans, dragging Priyantha's body, attacking him, and then hanging him and burning him, there was one man in Silkot on that fateful day who was putting his life on the line to protect Priyantha. He used his body to cover Priyantha when the mob was attacking him. And he was pleading everyone to stop. Because simply he was telling everybody Priyantha did not know how to read or write Urdu, so he would not have known what was written in that poster. And the person who stood up for Priyantha, his name is Malik Adnan. Thank you, Malik, for displaying humanity amidst insanity. All right, I want to get the Venerable Professor Madhugurabi this uh, Thero's reaction to how we as a nation should handle this difficult news. This country has gone through so many religious ethnic conflicts. Uh, that's coming up shortly. But before that, Mr. Dhani Duvithanavasam joins me right here in the studios with tonight's real story. Good evening, Dhani, good to see you. I'm, I'm posing that same question to you as well. Why aren't we seeing that uh, Me Too movement Sri Lankan brigade or, or, or the Black Lives Matter uh, a Sri Lankan version of it, uh, which we saw with the younger generation and, and, and with our, our, you know, the Colombians, if, 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 if I, or Colum Colombites, I think, <laughs> uh, um, you know, the, the, the fashionable Colombo people. Why, why aren't we seeing any kind of sympathy? No, no, you know, why do you think is that kind kind of um, you know, support is not being displayed. I think it's a, a very ironic sort of situation that is uh, on the ground in Sri Lanka because they are also they were fighting something on the lines of uh, structural racism, structural discrimination, stru a structural issue. And here also we see that similar structural issue when it comes to education and not even close to the kind of reaction because I'm on Facebook, I'm on these platforms and I don't see it at all. So I believe it's not, it's that that reward center isn't being activated when it comes to something that is relevant to Sri Lanka, but it is very much activated if it's westernized or something to do with uh, another country. This is exactly why I said, you know, it's not a, a catchy TikTok tune uh, for the moment. Uh, you can't rap a song uh, claiming that Black Lives Matter. Uh, you can rap a song claiming Black Lives Matter, but you can't do that for, for Priyanta, maybe, maybe. What do you think has gone wrong? 
Well, I think you really framed that within this show very well, and that was mindset. And we come to mindset a little bit uh, more comprehensive take when it comes to real story, and I think we can explore that further there. Now, Sri Lanka is currently at crossroads, which many other countries have also gone through in its developmental stages. But as has been abundantly made clear within this program, in particular, a concerted effort as a population to make a sociological change has been required for a long period of time. Massive growth stories in countries that were having far from great conditions are present all around Asia. Some of the most important examples are South Korea, Japan and China. All these countries followed their own strategy of development, but at one point implemented an industrial policy. An industrial policy requires a combined effort by all people of the country to push forward domestic manufacturing. This requires a hard-working society that puts the general well-being of the country over personal gain to increase the overall quality of life. All the aforementioned countries overcame some incredible disheartening times. Political scientist Chalmers Johnson explained in detail the Japanese growth story in his book Ministry of International Trade and Industry and the Japanese Miracle. In the conclusive chapters, he suggests, the priorities of the Japanese state derive first and foremost from an assessment of Japan's situational imperatives. These situational imperatives include delayed development, a lack of natural resources, a large population, the need to trade, and the constraints of international balance of payments. It may be possible to borrow Japan's priorities and institutions, but the situational nationalism of its people during the 1950s and 1960s is something other people would have to develop, not borrow. Between 1965 and 1990, four tigers, South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, and Hong Kong, were among the leaders in a period of rapid industrialization and economic growth that became known as the East Asian Miracle. Some analysts have linked this growth to these countries' reliance on government cultivation and support of strategic industries. In South Korea, the heavy and chemical industry drive between 1973 and 1979, alongside the development of global brands such as Hyundai, LG and Samsung, proved to be a major win for the country. South Korea's heavy and manufacturing industries is an instance in which activist industrial policy appears to have succeeded, even taking into account its fiscal costs and general equilibrium effects. Multiple studies on South Korea have shown that the process the country went from being a third world country at the end of the Second World War to one of the most developed and richest countries in the world as of modern times is partly thanks to the monumental effort made by its population. In contrast to these powerful shifts in mindset of countries that made them overcome economic barriers, Sri Lanka has a lot to learn. The victim mentality and the growing need to pass accountability to the executive in the least fair methods have been witnessed over time. Most of our problems are linked with the mindset and paradigm. What is happening in Sri Lanka, I think, so our mindset and paradigm are older, we have not updated, so therefore we do the wrong thing believing it is correct. This is quite evident today when looking at the explosion of certain domestic gas cylinders and the blame being pinpointed on the president. The tracing of accountability and the ability to take responsibility for one's actions is a lesson that needs to be learned by all Sri Lankans. Sri Lanka can undoubtedly become the next economic miracle in the world. It is high time that we push for the opportunities that are made available in the current status quo and heed to the idea that it is darkest before dawn. Mahesh, a lot of things to explore in today's program. <laughs> Indeed, uh, hopefully we'll try to get some, uh, you know, advice from the, the Venerable Thera and try to comprehend what is going on, what, what we need to do as Sri Lankans. Um, Dani Dutanavasam uh, with The Real Story. Thank you very much. Uh, let's take a short commercial break. On the other side, uh, Venerable Professor Madhaguda Abhay Thera. This is Get Real. Be back in a moment.